This is a production of Cornell University. All right, thanks Marvin for the introduction. And thanks all of you for coming here to see this presentation. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a nice British accent like our speaker last, last week. But um, I think it'll still be hopefully interested in, in what I have to say, especially because it has to do with strawberries. And I think most of you are enjoying some strawberry products right now. So we can all appreciate um, how to produce better strawberries and more strawberries. Um, like Marvin mentioned, I'm doing soil health in strawberry fields, specifically soil biological health and how, um, how we manage our so uh, that field affects the biological health indicators. So I'm just gonna kind of go through my research, the issue that we saw and then um, show you some of my results. So the first thing I want to do is define soil health. Usually when people talk about soil health they like to put this uh, Venn diagram up and say that soil health is at the intersection of your chemical, your physical, and your biological soil components. And They say soil health is right there in the middle. And that's true. Soil health does fall in the middle of all of these different soil components. However, I don't think that this diagram does a great job distinguishing the difference between a typical soil test and a soil health test. So um, for example, pH, which is a typical soil test um, that we'd run, you'd say that's chemical. However, um, when you think about it, the plants that grow in that soil and the microbes that live in that soil affect the pH and likewise, the pH of that soil affects the plants and the microbes that can grow in that soil. So really, pH is somewhere in this gray area here. And it, for another example, aggregation. That's, okay, we'd say that's a physical component of your soil. But then aggregation is helped by bacterial mucigels and fungal mycelia that help hold the aggregates together. So really, aggregation is also in this gray area here. So my idea is that while soil health does fall the intersection of these three, most soil health soil tests fall somewhere there. So to really um, explain soil health, I prefer to use the definition that was created by the Soil Science Society of America at their um, Committee on Soil Quality. So they define soil health as the capacity of a specific kind of soil to function within both managed and natural ecosystems um, to sustain plant and animal productivity, and we want to maintain and en or enhance uh, water and air quality and support human habitation. So there's kind of a lot in that definition and it might be hard to visualize just reading all of those words. So if I were to make a Venn diagram of soil health, it would be more like this. Um, I'd say that first and foremost we have to define what our soil function is. So are we growing something on these strawberries or on the on the soil or do we want to support a park or do we want to build a building what is the function of that soil and then once we've defined that function we want it to have ecosystem sustainability and we want it to maintain our air and water quality and then because we're a little bit egocentric we need it to support humans if it doesn't support us we're not going to manage that soil in that way for very long so it's a, it's a critical component of a healthy soil. Um, and at that intersection there, which is a little bit maybe smaller of an overlap, that's where we, we have a really healthy soil. Um, you might notice that most of these, all, all four of these, are, are somewhat defined components of soil. We, and we get to define them. From, so we get to say what the soil function is. And we get to say how it, that soil is um, supporting humans, which makes a lot of people a little bit, uh, a lot of scientists a little bit nervous about it because um, that means that since we're defining them that these definitions can shift with time and political and social movements. So for example, air and water quality. Right now climate change and uh, in the future climate change will also be a, a big issue. So we're concerned about carbon dioxide emissions. But um, a while back and who knows what will happen in the future, carbon dioxide emissions weren't really what we're concerned about. So today, carbon dioxide emissions might be part of a, of a, of a, of a healthy soil, but in the future or maybe in the past, they weren't. So you can see that we kind of get to put emphasis on what we want. So the health, healthy soil definition can kind of shift 
Um, so it can be a little difficult. Um, in our case, we're looking at healthy soil in a strawberry field. So that soil function that we've defined is to produce strawberries. And then that ecosystem sustainability, what we want it to do is to provide a good habitat for soil microbes. And hopefully that can help us reduce external inputs to the system because we won't have to add fertilizers as often, or external fertilizers, if the soil microbial community can do a good job of cycling nutrients back through the soil. Um, we also hope that it, the good soil microbial community will cut back on disease incidents and we won't have to put as many pesticides on the field. We still want this soil to maintain air and water quality and we need it to be profitable. If it's not profitable, a grower can't continue to grow strawberries that way. So um, that's kind of our soil health goal. That's what we want our soil to do. Unfortunately, there's no way to just measure all four of those bullet points with one test. There's no, uh, this is a soil health test. So what we do is we define our goal and then we have to come up with the desired soil functions that will get us to that goal. So for example, a desired soil function that we might have would be to increase that soil microbial community. And then we choose indicators that measure that soil um, desired function. So indicators that might uh, measure soil microbial community could be respiration or chloroform fumigation. And then we run that indicator test and we get a value from that. So let's say we run a respiration test and we get a value of you know, uh, 10 milliliters. Okay, what does that mean? That, that's, that's meaningless until we value it. So then we, th we put that indicator value onto, through a scoring function and we score it based on whether we want more of, that, more of that indicator, whether we want less of that indicator, or whether we want that indicator to fall within a specific range. And once it has a score, we can combine all the scores of all the indicators that we've tested, that we've run, and we get a final soil quality score. So there's no way to jump directly from here to here, but we can break this out, kind of tease it apart, and then hopefully combine it back together to get our soil quality score. And hopefully we've chosen our indicators appropriately so that they're, um, they accurately give a soil quality score um, that represents the soil in our field. So it can be a little bit difficult making sure that we've selected all these correct indicators and, and um, that our soil quality score relates back to this soil health goal. When we're choosing soil health indicators, there are a couple different um, parameters. First and foremost, they have to accurately target that soil function that we're interested in. Because if they're not, if they're not um, uh, targeting that, that function, then, then, it's, then it's somewhat meaningless. Um, but they also have to be quick to respond to management practices. Because if we change our management practice but the, the indicator test doesn't respond, we could be degrading our soil for many years before we realize that we have to go back and make some changes. Um, it's also important for them to be inexpensive, reliable, and fast. So um, that can be tricky and I think that as soil health tests become more and more popular that people will um, learn which indicators are more uh, useful. Back in 2008 Cornell created their own soil health training manual um, and it's available to growers and like I mentioned um, they had to choose indicators and they are upgrading their indicators so that they're more applicable to a healthy soil um, when I started, it's, uh, the indicators that were in a soil health test are different from the indicators that are there now. Um, and if we look at their test scorecard that they give you, if you get a Cornell soil health test, we can see that it kind of follows that flow chart that I showed you uh, a couple slides ago. So here we've got our chemical, our biological, and our physical components of our soil. And those would be the desired soil functions that they want the soil to uh, complete. And then they've chosen indicators here that uh, indicate those three different functions. So for example, um, one of the biological functions, we want our soil to function well biologically. So they've said percent organic matter is an indicator of how well your soil will function biologically. And then they ran that test and they got a value of 2.6. 
that value of 2.6. We don't really know what that means yet until we run it through a scoring function. And, and we score it based on whether we want more, less, our specific range. So they wanted more of percent organic matter. Um, and since 2.6 is somewhat low, they only gave it a rating, so a score of, of 25. And their rating scale goes from 1 to 100, 1 being the least desirable, and 100 being the most desirable. So um, you can see here we have a 100 for pH, a 100 for extractable phosphorus, but we go all the way down to 9 for potentially mineralizable nitrogen. So they score those each um, indicator, and then they combine them to an overall soil quality score. So this soil um, got a score of 64. And um, so that's kind of how it looks in reality. But the Cornell soil health test was developed mostly, mainly on uh, grain and vegetable crops. But my advisor, Marvin, wanted to try and make it more applicable to berry growers since um, we, we want to encourage berry growers to also have healthy soil. Um, and, and if any of you are interested, this is a yellow collar that's being developed out in Geneva. So we can be proud of our beautiful collards. Um, when Marvin gave Cornell Soil Health Test to berry growers across upstate New York, trying to make sure that this test was applicable to berry growers and get them excited about it, um, we looked at the strawberry uh, grower data on its own and noticed that the biological soil health indicators from those tests all came back very low. So you can see these are the biological indicators that we looked at organic matter, active carbon, potentially mineralizable nitrogen. And we can see that their indicator ratings on that scale from 1 to 100 are all kind of below 30. So um, they had pretty low soil biological health. And we were a little bit confused by this because strawberry growers add a lot of organic matter to their fields through straw. What they'll do is they'll put straw on their fields in the fall. Um, and when you, when you pile straw up, it traps a lot of air and acts as a really great insulator for, um, for the plants. So they'll put the straw on in the winter. Um, and if they've piled enough on there, you can see that they have nice um, undamaged flowers in the spring. However, if they don't put enough on or they don't insulate their, their plants, they can get uh, cold damage, especially in the early spring, like we see here with this um, black flower. So they, they put them on in the fall. They let them overwinter. And then in the spring, the growers will come and they'll rake the straw between the rows. And then the straw that was once an insulator then becomes a mulch. And this mulch layer is really important because it keeps, it keeps the berries up off the, gr off the soil. The soil carries a lot of berry diseases. And if the soil can't reach the berry, then it doesn't get those diseases. Um, so it's a really important uh, layer between, between the soil and the berry. It also keeps the berries clean. And that's important because a strawberry grower can't wash their berries before they ship their berries. <clears throat> if they were to wash their berries before shipping them, by the time it reached the consumer, the berries would be rotted. But on the other hand, no consumer is going to want to buy dirty berries. So having those clean berries where the soil can't bounce up on, onto them from the rain is really important. So we're adding a lot of organic matter to these systems. Nonetheless, we have low soil biological health. It was a little bit confusing. However, we know that straw has a really high carbon to nitrogen ratio. And it's been shown in other studies that carbon to nitrogen radio ratio, um, especially when high, can have a negative effect on soil biological health. Um, this is a, a graph from a different experiment. But if we just focus on two lines here, we've got um, broccoli residue in the, the solid black line. And this dotted line is broccoli residue plus wheat straw. So broccoli residue on its own has a very low carbon to nitrogen ratio. But broccoli residue plus wheat straw has a much higher carbon to nitrogen ratio. And then on this y-axis here, we have net nitrogen mineralization. And you can see that the zero, no nitrogen mineralization, is, is, right, is right here. So if we have that low um, carbon to nitrogen ratio amendment, the broccoli, we can see that we're having positive net nitrogen mineralization. But if we put on that 
higher carbon to nitrogen amendment where we add in the wheat straw, we can see that we actually have negative nitrogen mineralization, meaning that we're having nitrogen immobilization. And so that's indicating that there's uh, poor biological soil health. It's not, it's not the goal that we want. We want more nitrogen in our soil, not less. So we were thinking that the high carbon to nitrogen ratio of straw was possibly having a negative effect on the um, plants, uh, or on the soil health. Oops. Strawberry growers also typically use cultivation to uh, deal with their weeds. Um, a lot of herbicides target broadleaf perennial plants, and unfortunately strawberries are also broadleaf perennial plants. So instead of using herbicides, they often will just cultivate and, and till their soil. Um, but there have been a lot of studies showing that cultivation can have a negative impact on soil biology. So here, we're looking again at a study from somebody else, but um, the two treatments to your left are um, no-till treatments. And the two treatments to your right, these are conventionally tilled treatments. And I just want to point out that um, the no-tilled treatments have a lot more fungal hyphae than the conventionally tilled treatments. So um, you can just see that tilling can decrease soil biological life. And therefore, we thought maybe that the high intensity of tilling in a strawberry field was also having a negative effect. Um, so what we did is we designed an experiment out here in um, East Ithaca where we put on four different, well, we had four different soil amendment treatments um, along a carbon to nitrogen ratio scale. So you can see sawdust had a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio, and then straw was somewhere in the middle, and then grass had a very low car carbon to nitrogen ratio. And, we, um, and then we also had an unamended control. We put those amendments on the soil in fall of 2013, and then we tilled them into the soil. And then in the spring of 2014, we planted um, honey oyster strawberries on that field. I want to make it clear that this is not what a grower would do. A grower would just simply plant their strawberries directly into the field in the spring and then um, apply that straw it, for winter protection in the late fall, early summer, and then would rake that um, straw into the rows in the next spring. And then as they tilled, that would eventually become a soil amendment. But we wanted, since I'm only going to be here for two and a half years, we wanted to get a little bit of a jump start. So we applied the amendments to the soil right away to, to try to see if we could um, make uh, differences in our soil health uh, indicators more quickly. And then we, um, this, is, this is your, uh, he was department chair at the time. So <laughs> this is what a typical department chair does. <laughs> um, are you ready, Steve, to do that? <laughs> But um, anyway, so we had two different tillage treatments as well. We tilled half of our plots as shallow as possible, and then we tilled half of our um, plots about um, a foot deep. Uh, here you can see us tilling uh, with the, uh, what is it, the Reggie Weeder, Weeder Rotary Cultivator. So um, yeah. This is a, a picture of our plot map, and you can see the four different soil amendments that we added are indicated by the different colors. We've got unamended treatments in blue. We've got grass amended treatments in green, um, straw amended treatments in that brown color, and then sawdust amended treatments in purple. And then we hatched the, uh, the plots that are that were deep tilled, and then the ones that aren't hatched are shallow tilled treatments. Um, I wanted to give you a quick uh, timeline of what we did so that just to make sure everyone's on the same page um, again we applied these we applied these soil amendments in the fall of 2013 and then we let them over winter we didn't take the first soil sample until the next May and then we planted our strawberries actually after our first soil sample um, and then we took our second and third soil samples and again applied more amendments in the fall of 2014 um, we let those over winter, and then in May again, we took a four soil sample, harvested the berries in June of 2015, and then took our fifth soil sample in August. 
Um, we didn't want to confound our amendment study by putting straw on for winter protection. So instead of using straw, we used row cover. So you can see that here. Um, just want to make sure that you know that we didn't use straw, even though growers often do. They can also use row cover. And then every time we took a soil sample, we looked at five different soil uh, parameters. We, we did a soil respiration test. We did a potentially mineralizable nitrogen test, a carbon to nitrogen ratio test, pH, and soil moisture. And then before I start talking about data, there's one more thing that I wanted to explain. So we weren't sure if we should sample between the rows where we were actually applying the amendments and where we were, we were actually um, you know, cultivating, or if we should sample within the rows where the strawberries were actually growing. So we weren't, we weren't sure which would be, um, have a greater effect on the soil health parameters. So what we did is we sampled in both and kept them separate. Um, so that's why when you look at these tables, you see an amendment treatment and then a tillage depth treatment and then you see a sample location treatment. And we didn't have a sample location treatment this first sample date because we didn't have any strawberries. So there weren't any rows to sample between or within. So we just sampled that date. And then for all the rest of the dates, there's, there's this additional sample location um, treatment, which indicates whether we sampled between the rows or within the rows. Um, and so here we're looking at our respiration data. You can see the five different sample dates all the way to the left. And then we've got um, not significant data is indicated all the way to the right here with an NS. And then um, these are, these are p-values that we've showed you that are, that are significant. And you can see that amendment often has a significant effect on um, soil respiration. But tillage depth does not. We also see a slight interaction effect between the amendment and the sample location here on the second date. So what does that mean? We take a look at the graph here. You can see our, on our y-axis, we've got the milliliters of CO2 respired. And then down here on the x-axis, we've got each sample date. And then the first sample date, we only have between data because we didn't have rows. And then every other sample date, we have both between and within. And within is kind of a little bit grayer, if, if that helps you see this uh, graph a little bit better. And we've got our four different soil amendments, unamended, grass, straw, and sawdust. So we noticed that sawdust often had higher respiration than any of the other treatments. Um, but if you remember from that chart, the second sample date had an interaction effect between the uh, soil amendment and the sample location. So we can see that within, uh, straw had the highest respiration. But between the rows, straw and sawdust had actually the same respiration. So that's where we get that interaction effect coming into play. Um, so we thought this was really interesting. But we were a little concerned because we're adding sawdust. And sawdust has a really high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So we're adding an amendment with a lot of carbon. So you'd think, well, obviously, we can get more carbon dioxide if we're adding more carbon to the system. So we decided we were going to try to uh, fix that. And we changed our y-axis from total milliliters of carbon dioxide emitted to um, grams of carbon respired per gram of carbon in the soil, because we had measured the carbon um, in the soil as well for each sample. So this is the same chart, but with a different y-axis. Um, and we can see that the, the graph looks pretty much the same. Usually, we still have highest, the highest respiration in our sawdust amended soil, except on this second sample date, straw has higher uh, respiration both, both between and within the rows. So that was kind of interesting. Then we took a look at our potentially mineralizable nitrogen data. And we can see that, once again, tillage depth had no um, significant effect on any of our uh, on p potentially mineralizable nitrogen. Um, but amendment did. But it mostly had an effect in the sp two springs. And then a slight, uh, a slight amendment and sample location interaction effect in the summer of 2015. So if we look at that uh, graphically, again, that first sample date, it's interesting. We see high p potentially mineralizable, again, in the, uh, the sawdust amended treatment. Um, 
So that kind of lined up with our uh, respiration data, and that was, that was interesting. Um, but then the second spring, we didn't see that same, that, that same lineup. So um, we can see that sawdust does have high respiration, um, but it is tied with the grass and the straw amended soil. Um, and then, I, like I mentioned, we had that slight interaction effect um, on the final sample date. So you can see that between and within had slightly different responses for potentially mineralizable nitrogen. And if we now look at our carbon and nitrogen data, there is no real significant uh, effect of uh, any of our treatments on carbon to nitrogen ratio. So the reason this is really interesting is because even though we were adding soil amendments with vastly different carbon to nitrogen ratios to our soil, it wasn't coming through in the soil itself. So in, if we had continued this study um, for many years, or if we had added vastly more uh, of our soil amendment, we might expect to see that carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, differ um, between the treatments. But apparently, the amount that we added for the time that we added it, there was no difference in that ratio. Um, this is also really interesting because remember, if you remember back to respiration, we, we changed our respiration uh, y-axis from total milliliters of carbon dioxide to grams of uh, carbon emitted through respiration per gram of carbon in the soil. And um, we can see that there was no real difference between our different soil treatments in the, carbon, in the amount of carbon and nitrogen that was in the soil. So even though we, we made that conversion, since we didn't see differences in carbon and nitrogen ratio data, we didn't really see any differences in those two graphs when we changed the y-axis. So that may be part of the reason why the respiration looked the same, depending either way we looked at it. Uh, when we looked at pH, there were no differences in uh, pH based on any of the treatments that we applied. However, um, we, when we, we looked between the rows and within the rows, we could see uh, differences. So at first, um, the, well, this, this sample date here, they were the same. However, after that, within the rows had lower pH than um, between the rows. And this makes sense because when we fertilized, we used urea and we, uh, did, we did banded fertilization. We didn't broadcast the fertilizer, we just put it right next to the plants. So, um, and, and urea can slightly acidify your soil, and I think we're seeing part of that effect here. Also, when plants uptake nutrients, they're emitting, they can emit some acidic compounds and um, slightly acidify the soil, and I think the combination of those two is the reason why we're seeing um, more acidic soil in between the, uh, within the rows than between. So that was kind of cool to see. Um, soil moisture, again, we look and we don't really see any um, pattern of uh, differences based on our different treatments. There are some significant um, effects, but it was not uh, consistent, so we, we can't really say, say much about soil moisture. Um, we think this might just have to do to the fact that soil moisture is pretty variable. Um, it can change from day to day and from uh, location to location depending upon what the soil, uh, what it's covered with and, and who's drawing moisture out of that soil. So we didn't really see much of interest with soil moisture. So the first question that we really wanted to answer was, do soil amendments and tillage depth have an effect on soil biological health indicators? And we can say yes and no. Yes. Uh, amendment had an effect on respiration and potentially mineralizable nitrogen, but uh, tillage depth didn't really have an effect on any of our soil health indicators. But we also wanted to look at yield, um, and if you guys remember back to the uh, timeline that I showed, the yield, we only took, we only harvested the berries once, so we only have one set of yield data, um, just to keep that in the back of your mind. But we, um, here you can see our amendment and our depth treatments, and we tried to see if there was an effect on the marketable yield and the plant, the plant density. And you can see that there is both an effect of amendment on marketable yield and plant density. So if we come down here and we look at our marketable yield, uh, straw had a significantly lower 
yield than any of the other amendments that we added to our soil, as well as it had significantly lower plant density than any of the other amendments that we added to the soil. Um, this was surprising because, well, first of all, it's not along that carbon to nitrogen ratio scale that we had at first thought was going to be the issue. We thought that if straw had lower yield, that sawdust would have even lower yield, but that didn't seem to be the case. Um, and straw is also what growers typically use, so they might not realize that the, uh, they're not producing strawberries to the fullest potential yield that they could get. Um, we calculated it and it would, was about a 20% decrease uh, in, or loss in profits and yield, so that's pretty significant. You could, you could even see it out in the field. I know this is not the best picture, but um, if you look here, this is a straw amended plot, as well as here, here, there, and some right over in that corner there. And it's really hard to see the plants in those plots. That's why they're kind of easy to pick out. And it's true that the straw is kind of mounded up, and that may be one reason why um, you can't see the, plant, the plants very well in this picture. But also the plants were very short and small, and, and, and that's another reason why you can't see the plants so well in this picture in the straw amended plots. Um, if you look at it this way, it might be a little easier to see. In the middle, we have our straw amended soil. Um, on the bottom, we have our unamended soil. And then on the top, we have our sawdust amended soil. And all these plants were planted on the same day and the same distance apart. And it's pretty visually uh, clear that the straw amended uh, soil produced smaller plants, or they grew slower than the rest of the unamended and the sawdust amended treatments, as well as the grass. But grass we expected to have good growth because it had a lot of nitrogen. Um, but we didn't expect straw to actually decrease growth, which it seemed to, to do because our unamended soil had, had better growth than, than the straw amended soil. I know, yeah. And that's even one of the reasons, that's one of the hypotheses of why we name strawberries strawberries, because we grow them in straw. So what are we going to do? I don't know if we're going to have to rename them or, yeah? Wheat, yeah, wheat straw, yes, sorry. So is there a possibility of the Yeah, so, so, good question. Well, I'm going to get to that question in two slides. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the first thing I wanted to point out is that even though we saw these decreased yields and we saw the decreased density, we are not going to recommend to growers currently that they should stop using straw. Because if you remember at the beginning, straw has a lot of benefits. It, it insulates the berries and then it provides that nice thick mulch layer between the soil and the berry. And that not only decreases diseases, it also keeps the berries clean. So here on our y-axis now, this is a good thing. We have grams of unmarketable strawberries. And you can see that our unmarketable strawberries in the straw amended soil were, were much lower. So if I had shown you total yield data that uh, when I, two slides ago, or I think three slides ago, the, the differences between the straw and the sawdust and the grass amended treatments would have been much greater. But you can see how much straw decreased disease. So it still has a lot of benefits. You can also see it keeping the strawberry up off the soil. You can't see the soil in this picture because you know, there's, a, there's a nice thick layer. And that's really important for berry growers before they ship, for when they ship their berries. Now, um, we don't think that it's OK to have reduced yields. So we tried this past winter to figure out what it was that was decreasing yield, what mechanism in the straw was actually causing this decreased yield. And we came up with a couple different uh, ideas. The first being, just like Jane pointed out, we thought maybe it's a chemical leachate because wheat straw has been shown to have um, allelopathic effects on other plants. We also were thinking maybe it was some kind of microbial community. Um, uh, maybe the straw was encouraging a microbial community to grow there that, that was actually detrimental to strawberry plant growth. We thought that maybe there was like a physical barrier, like when the, when the strawberry plants were um, sending out their daughter plants, their runners, and then the daughter plants were trying to send down those roots, but the roots couldn't make it uh, to the soil quick enough, and that was decreasing growth. Um, or, or we thought maybe there was some kind of herbicide residue left over on that straw that was uh, uh, then affecting those strawberry plants, because like we mentioned, strawberry plants are broadly perennial as are most herbicides, uh, as do most herbicides target. So we tried all these things in the greenhouse, but unfortunately, we weren't actually able to 
recreate the negative growth that we saw in the field in the greenhouse, which was a little bit disappointing because we, we would really hope that we'd be able to answer that question, like what is it in the straw that's, that's causing reduced growth? Um, but the greenhouse environment and the outdoor environment are very different. And so, you know, it's possible that there was just some key element out in the field that we didn't recreate in the greenhouse that was, that was what would have made us been able to answer this question. Um, but it's really interesting, and someone hopefully will answer it. Um, so do treatments affect yield? Uh, again, we can say yes and no. Amendments do affect yield. Straw can decrease yield. But uh, tillage didn't have much of an effect, or it didn't have any effect. The last thing we tried to do is we tried to correlate our soil uh, health parameters with yield. So you can see here uh, all the way to the left we have marketable yield and along the top we have our five different soil health parameters and we were hoping that some of them would be uh, highly correlated but we didn't really see any pattern so we, we, we don't have anything to say about how soil health can directly affect yield at this time. Uh, that being, s oh, so are soil health indicators correlated with yield? Uh, we haven't been able to show that yet. That being said, that doesn't, s yield falls under this human support and, and that soil functionality. It doesn't really fall under ecosystem sustainability or uh, helping to maintain air and water quality. So we can still be increasing our soil health overall, but not um, increasing yield. And this is important because, you know, we planted strawberries in, in a soil that hadn't had strawberries planted in it for many years. Um, it was pretty, pretty good soil, um, and all, all of our plants overall grew, grew very well. So th there wasn't a lot of diseases built up in the soil. There weren't a lot of pests, strawberry-specific pests living in the area. So our system wasn't very stressed. And it'd be really interesting to see what happened when the system did become stressed. That's when a healthy soil might really help increase yield or keep yields high where an unhealthy soil would kind of drop off. So we think that maybe with time these effects might, might become more clear. Um, I just wanted to quickly go over, like kind of highlight what we, what we found in the study because there was kind of a lot, it was a little bit all over the board. So to reiterate, soil amendments do affect soil health indicators, um, but not based on that carbon to nitrogen ratio scale like we originally thought. Um, if they had, then sawdust would have had the highest respiration and the highest PMN, and then uh, grass amended soil would have had the lowest, but that's not, that's not what we always saw. Um, tilling did not affect the soil health indicators in our study. Um, however, it was only a two-year study, and most tilling experiments are long-term. So we were thinking that, um, with, we were hoping that the soil health parameters would react so quickly to these management practices that they would kind of let us give us a heads up that it was maybe degrading our soil biological health, but it didn't appear to do that. In the long term, it would be interesting to see what, what happens. We saw that pH was higher between the rows than it was within the rows, um, which was interesting. And uh, soil amendments do affect yield, but again, not based on that carbon to nitrogen ratio scale. So sawdust or straw had the lowest yield, but sawdust did not have even lower, or grass did not have even higher yields. So again, tilling did not affect yield, but like we mentioned, this is only a two-year study, and uh, most tilling experiments are long-term. Be interesting to see what happens in the long term. <coughs> We were unable to find a link between soil health and yield, but um, over time, when, when more stressors enter the environment, we might be able to find a correlation. And even though straw decreased strawberry growth and yield, um, we were unable to figure out exactly what it was about the straw that was decreasing growth, and so um, we're not going to recommend that growers stop using straw altogether yet. Um, maybe if they want to try using a little less straw in certain parts of their field, although they have to make sure they put enough on there to adequately um, insulate, or if they want to try using some straw in another amendment in conjunction with the straw, maybe that would be good. But until we know, we can't really say what it is that you need to change to, to get your yield back up to its full potential. And quickly before I finish, I just wanted to thank everyone who helped make this research possible, because I certainly couldn't have done it on my own. 
First and foremost, I want to thank Marvin, who's my advisor, and then everyone who works with him, both Casper and Kathy was a huge part of this research, um, and she's greatly missed. Um, I also need to really thank Johannes and his lab because he let me use his lab space. Um, and with his lab space come Kelly and Akio, who are his technicians who also really help whenever you have a soil question. Um, I used some lab space in the Cornell Nutrient Analysis Laboratory, and Tim Dodge really helped keep those strawberries alive when they needed to be watered. Uh, couldn't have done it without funding from both the Hatch and the Horticulture Department. Um, and thanks to you graduate students and the SIPS departments, but mostly horticulture, and also my family. And I think we have some time for questions, but not too much, so yeah, thanks. <laughs> that for that field? So can you tell us what the measurements like soil organic matter or whatever, you, you didn't, we, the, no, the so first the, test. Yeah, so the first test, that. yeah, so the first test was just uh, to kind of show you what the Cornell Soil Health Lab does. But we didn't use the Cornell Soil Health Lab to do our test right. because uh, when we were really interested in doing a respiration test, and at the time, they didn't include that, but right. now they do. Right. Um, so we kind of chose our own soil health parameters. That's why we did CDN ratio, respiration, PMN. So we don't have those specific tests that uh, would have been wrong. So is that how that was able? Yeah? Two questions, Maria. First is, how much straw or sawdust or, or grass did you apply? Yeah, so we used the... Uh, the amount that a strawberry grower would typically apply, which I think was like two tons an acre, three tons, three tons an, an acre, acre um, to insulate. And then we uh, dried that, uh, weighted, and then we added an equivalent mass basis for uh, sawdust and grass. Okay. The second question is on the I marketable yield. Mm -hmm. Straw treatment uh, had lower mm -hmm. I marketable yield. Yeah. But on a percentage basis, would that be the same or still lower? Um, I, I, I don't think I ran that, but I, uh, I, I don't think it does. Okay, I think it might be a good idea to express the data on a percentage basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback, but I don't have a pen. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else have any questions? Yeah. What what threshold were you using for the marketable berry? Yeah, so that was interesting. At the time, you were like, well, you can market a berry that it, it, you can't market a berry that has disease. And this summer we had a lot of disease. So because um, remember, if you remember in June, it rained like almost every day, or, or maybe every other day. Um, so anything that was rotten, we we said that was unmarketable. We also there was a lot of slugs. So anytime there was slug damage that was not okay. Um, if the berry was broken in any way from someone stepping on it or if it had cracked, that was not okay. But at the time we were like, oh, well, if it's dirty, that's probably okay. But but I don't think, uh, so we included dirty berries in our marketable yield, but we probably shouldn't have because in reality, although the berry is, is, is intact and it's fine, it doesn't have any diseases, it doesn't, it doesn't you know, it doesn't have any cuts it probably would be hard for a grower to market it because they'd have to wash it and then sell it immediately. Or you'd have to market only you pick people who, who are okay with the berries that then they go take home and wash. So the berries were fine competing, but they weren't really good for uh, wetness. Yeah? Is grass used as a mulch or as organic matter? Yeah, so we, so um, that first fall in 2013, we incorporated that right into the soil to kind of get a jump start. So that was more of an amendment. And then the next fall, instead of tilling those amendments in, we just left them on the surface of the soil, trying to kind of emulate what a strawberry grower would do, because they wouldn't amend them, in, or they wouldn't till them into the soil until the next spring when they uh, needed to weed. So we did that. We just left them on the soil surface, and then the next spring when we needed to weed, that's when we use, that's when it kind of came from a mulch into an amendment. Yeah? Do any New York growers use just black plastic mulch that they see in California? Yeah, but they don't uh, produce them quite the same way that they do in California. It's a little bit of a different system, but they do use black plastic mulch, so that's an important option. Sometimes they still use straw between the rows because it's also nice just for if you have you pick for people to walk on. 
but yeah. Yeah. Um, are strawberry growers normally growing strawberries in the same field for many years? And like, how long, how often do they replace them? Things like that. Yeah. So they'll replace their strawberry plants maybe after three or four years. Um, that's when it kind of doesn't become, a, it, when it's not economical anymore to keep them, because every time they produce berries, they'll produce a little bit smaller or a little less the next year. Um, the recommendation is that they rotate after that three or four years, but in reality, that doesn't always happen. A lot of times they do keep their, their fields in the same spot. They just like to grow their strawberries in this one spot. So um, some do, they probably should, some don't. Is it possible that this trial is keeping the soil temperature a little bit lower in yep. the than compared to the others? In the, I guess in the uh, in the greenhouse it doesn't seem to be affected with the, the average temperature is high. Yeah, I mean that, that exact. So yeah, um, straw was most likely keeping the temperature lower. We didn't measure soil temperature, but um, from other literature that I've read, it usually does keep the soil temperature lower. Um, and then in the greenhouse, yeah, it was. The temperature was regulated, so and then you have those pots and they're sitting up high, so it could have something to do with soil temperature. Um, also, in the greenhouse, we, we we worked hard to we got like longer, deeper pots and tried to plant the strawberries a little lower without them being too low into the pot and then piling the mulch on top. But um, we probably didn't get the same amount of mulch that we got. We were able to get on the field where you can just really pile it on there, which, which a grower typically does. So it might also have to do with the amount of straw that we used in the greenhouse. So, yeah. Yeah? So um, for vegetables and rural crops, they're really pushing this Cornell soil health test. Mm -hmm. For orchard systems and vineyard systems, we've had a hard time really showing that that suite of tests really, you know, tells us very much about soil health. So, yeah. for strawberries, strawberry growers, should they be using the so soil test? And if not, is there a modification that you that would I'm think would be useful to add to the Cornell test to make mm -hmm. it useful for strawberry growers? Yeah. So that that was kind of what like originally motivated this. Is that okay? You know, should this be used for berry growers? Um, can we get them excited about? Does it even mean anything? And that's why we were really hoping at the end to correlate soil, these soil health parameters with yield. Um, I would say that there are probably benefits to the soil health test. Because when we when we gave the the soil health test to all those berry growers, their their chemical and their physical uh, soil parameters all came back. You know, in the greens, a few yellows mixed in there, so they were they were all fine. It was when you went to the biological components, that's when we got, we saw the red and then we saw the really low value score, like scores. So I think that a grower sees their chemical and their uh, physical components on a regular basis when they take their soil test and they, they see that and they, they can manage their soil for that, for, for those components. But they never test the biological components so they can't see how they're doing. And um, to be honest, I think that Soil health is, is something that is still somewhat new and uh, maybe not within the science community, but when you're trying to translate it from talking about it and, and developing a test to actually implementing that test as a grower in the field. And so I think that there's going to be a lot of modifications that will have to be made to the soil tests that are available. Um, and I don't know the best, the best indicators because selecting those indicators is really Critical, but I think there's a lot of um, a lot of developments being made, especially in soil microbiology. And I think that hopefully those will trickle down, and those kind of tests will become less expensive and more indicative of how the soil biological community kind of really is is looking. Because right now we're just doing is there a lot or is there a little? That's really crude. It would be better if we could do what is there? Is it antagonistic? Is it protagonistic? So I think that. Those will get better with time, but right now uh, we need we need the data to be able to make that better. Um, so we want people to get on board. But I think that when we look back in 50 years, we'll be like, "Well, those tests weren't very good." But we need to start somewhere. So. Thanks so much.
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.